Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar presented jointly by Four Flow and Chipeo. We're very excited to have you all here today. My name is Bastian Kuhn, and I'm the Strategic Account Executive at Chipeo for FMCG. Today, we're going to talk about dynamic capacity management, creating better collaboration between retailers, manufacturers, and carriers in FMCG. Today, our presenters are first Felix Kamara, Vice President at Fourflow. Fourflow is the leading provider of supply chain consulting, software, and PL services. And on the other hand, we have my colleague Thomas, Thomas, Thomas Spika, Director, Central Europe at Chapeo. Chapeo is the European leader in real time transportation visibility. And um, Thomas is managing the growth and coordinating operational activities in the whole region. So, welcome to both of you, Thomas and Felix. Before I give the floor to our speakers, let us just briefly walk through uh, the agenda that we have for today. First point we're going to talk about is uh, how collaboration and real time visibility enable capacity management. And secondly, what are the benefits for all stakeholders along the supply chain? And then, like I mentioned, we are going to wrap it up with uh, questions and answers. So um, let me uh, give the floor over to you, Felix. Thanks for, for having us today, and also thanks for, for joining everyone. Um, the quality of your work is largely determined by, by three factors. That is how much you know, how much you practice, <clears throat> and to, to typically a much smaller extent by your inherited talent. What really matters is, is what you know. Here's our promise uh, to you for today. At the end of the 60 minutes, uh, you will know some things about capacity management that you did not know before. Today, you will see some examples um, that you can put into your armamentarium. Some of those can be used for your, useful for you in the future, um, and you may incorporate some of them into your repository. And to build a fence around it, what you will not be doing today is to pro provide you with the blueprint turnkey solution for any conflicts that you may have between retailers and, and uh, FMCG companies. But we're looking at it from a, from a logistics perspective and discussing how that can be facilitated. When we look at the supply chain in FMCG and consumer goods, um, it, is, it looks like a relatively simple supply chain uh, with manufacturers, with logistics service providers, and with retailers. It is not uh, as simple as it looks, right? So there are a couple of reasons that make it, that add additional complexity to it. <clears throat> One is that at least two of the three parties are typically operating on low profit margins. There's a high level of volatility in the network and the performance of the supply chain can have a direct impact on sales and profits. The stakeholders in this environment have conflicting interests and objectives and are also working with limited resources. This creates friction. It leads to higher supply chain costs, a reduced network performance, and most particularly, a limited ability to act during peaks and during crises. But besides all these other aspects, it also leads to operational process inefficiencies. And Thomas will share a little bit on how that can look like. And Yeah, thank you, Felix. Also, welcome to everybody uh, to the session. Um, probably to kick this off and to put some color around what Felix just mentioned, uh, we, we did a study uh, within our customer network just to identify the four main uh, cost drivers or inefficiency drivers that we are seeing in this network when we speak about FMCG retail, uh, knowing that the carriers in between uh, these twos. Um, so what we typically see is um, that there are high admin costs. Why? Because uh, everybody today on the retail side is probably using a slot booking tool or has some kind of planning when actually the goods should arrive and when the truck should be in front of the gates in order to unload, which then goes into the crosstalk and then is prepared for, uh, for the delivery to the different stores the retailer has. Now, we, we do see actually that only 45, 50% of the slots actually book are hit on the correct time. So that means trucks are in half of uh, the time, the trucks doesn't show up at the right time, can be earlier, can be late. And all this results in a lot of manual work, knowing where the truck is, probably getting uh, the supply on the phone, probably getting the carrier on the phone, uh, sending emails back and forth. So, so, so we do actually see that this is one of the very, uh, uh, very uh, first one cost drivers in, in this network. Of course, if uh, trucks uh, don't show up at the time as they should be for whatever reasons, traffic, uh, weather can be anything, 
uh, it leads to waiting time, dueling times. We have uh, uh, people or uh, trucks sitting on the parking space who cannot unload as planned. We have other uh, trucks probably arriving too early. Um, we have others waiting already. So there's a whole, um, uh, what we call the orchestra to be done, uh, where we actually take different flows and put them into a broader picture to avoid these uh, uh, waiting and dueling times, which then results in higher costs and fees. The other side is also inside of the warehouse, because if you look at how uh, retailers typically, or FMCG, FMCG companies typically structure their work on site in the DCs, um, there is uh, different teams working uh, on, on the uh, reception side, on the receiving side. There are other teams preparing then the other side where it goes into the store delivery. And this, again, needs to be orchestrated. There needs to be fact-based decision. We need to put the right information into these DCs and warehouses to enable and to leverage the capacities that we do have actually on the ground. And then there's the last point, which is coming more and more also to the attention of all uh, stakeholders in this network is around security. So if uh, we can push all the necessary information to the drivers, to the carriers, to the shippers, to make sure that they fully understand what is required to deliver to a certain warehouse, to which uh, dock they need to deliver, what kind of equipment is needed, et cetera, et cetera. This will also uh, then result in, in less time spent on site and therefore meaning less costs uh, and, and better efficiency uh, rates in this uh, in this network. And I think Felix, you also have some uh, some examples around this on the on the next topic. Yes, we'll we'll definitely have that. Thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> as briefly outlined also by Bastian, right, we're in a circle um, with with uh, producers, with manufacturers, with retail companies, but also with the LSPs and. Um, we have some conflicts in that area. Um, and now you may ask yourself, how do we overcome this? Yeah, we're getting there. We will show you some ways how to do that. Um, but let me first state that we, we at Forflow and we at GPR truly believe in, in the power of neutrality. So that is particularly a value that a neutral planning and a neutral technology can happen in an environment um, where collaboration um, is desired, but where it also typically ends when, when you start talking about money. In the next minutes, we will explore um, how this circle can be filled uh, with life, how this can be added and enriched, uh, and also how uh, technology is supporting this, and how the the power of technology can then be operationalized uh, and utilized in day to day operation. Yeah, Felix, and I think you're already mentioning one important uh, step in there, which is neutrality, but it's also technology, because uh, if you want to take decisions which are in favor with everybody in the stake uh, in the network uh, for each of the stakeholders. We need to have data. We need to make choices based on data, not on guesses or, or on something that we experience. We really need to have this data. And we are seeing since now a couple of years that this data becomes more and more available. Typically at Shipio, what we see is uh, we use more and more APIs. We do integrate into the carrier world. The carrier in itself, they do invest into IT infrastructure. Uh, a couple of years or probably in the last decade, we have seen uh, carriers who wouldn't even have a telematic system. This typically in Western Europe is now changing. Uh, but we do also have a lot of other connections where we can retrieve data that is needed to create this neutral data fund or foundation that we need to then base our, our decisions on. If you look on the right side, it's just uh, an example illustrating where we can get there and where we do retrieve the data, which is then used in our and in the four flow analysis to better plan and execute the network. We do see, of course, a lot of real-time data because that's what really going to help us in the end to make the right decision, operational decisions, once the network has been designed and optimized. Um, and we do also believe that it's a mix of the data set that is available, I'm talking about, as I mentioned, probably telematics, probably about uh, some app usage, but also a lot of information that is available uh, uh, coming from parcel carriers, from IoT. We do see a lot of interesting projects now in the industry that we break it down, going away from the truck level, going down to the pallet level, even going down to the box level to understand really where is my, uh, my delivery, when is it going to arrive, and, and seeing this trend and, and uh, probably digging a bit deeper in understanding this trend. It also means that Typically, when we wanted to retrieve this data, when we wanted to enrich or base our decision on something that is out there, um, there were high initial costs, which are typically CapEx costs. This is now changing. We see with a very light approach, as we do have it at, at Shipio, with very light standardized integration, 
We go in lower OPEX cost, meaning it uh, uh, making this data available to everybody and also making sure that all the stakeholders, probably also the smaller carrier, which has only uh, 10, 15 or 30 trucks, uh, which is a family run business and making sure that he can also participate to this network. Um, and that's uh, also one, one important um, uh, uh, development that we are seeing. Um, and I think now we are getting a bit deeper. How can we increase this and how can we do this now better, uh, knowing that we have the data um, and that the data now is available? So now, now we know where we are, right? So we've established um, technology is, is becoming more and more available. Um, there's more and more supply chain stakeholders that can, can participate in that. The ecosystem is growing. Um, we've established the, the conflicts and constraints and uh, that, they are, that are existing in the FMCG um, supply chain. Um, the key question is, how can we do it better? Um, and at Forflow, we've defined three principles to achieve this. Um, one is to, do, to structurally analyze the network and to build redundancies and bypasses in the network. That is happening on a more strategic level. Um, <clears throat> similar is, is the preparation for the dynamics, and that accounts both for process and IT readiness. You need to be ready for the change, and the change is coming, um, but you need to be prepared for that. So that is um, a, a task which which uh, needs is a more of a preparatory task, um, but it is of high importance. And then on an operational level, on a day-to-day -day level, where there's only a limited degree of freedom, um, what you need to do is, of course, you need to work with the constraints that you have and then avoid to waste the resources that you have. So really looking at a high utilization um, of the physical assets in the supply chain, and that can then be warehouses, loading and unloading slots or unloading capacities, but also, of course, trucks. Um, they need to be, the, the utilization of these assets needs to be maximized. All these principles typically come, come with a trade-off, right? Um, there's only a certain level um, of flexibility or volatility that you can account for, uh, and costs increase significantly the more um, you want to cover. Um, so that is a constraint and that you need to, or a trade-off that you need to keep in mind, and that we typically also um, keep in mind. So making sure that we, we're covering a, a large majority of the cases of the volatility that is happening, while keeping in mind the end-to-end -end, um, costs of, of the system. Related, related to the operations, we would let then um, <clears throat> look at how are we really achieving the target of maximizing the utilization of, of the assets. Um, the first step, and that is a key aspect, is having the real-time transparency, the real-time visibility of what is happening in your supply chain. Then. You need to have the decision support systems in place to activate the right actions based on the information that you have received from the real-time visibility that you have. And then one of those actions can be, of course, the allocation or the reallocation of your resources and that in a dynamic way. We will uh, show you a customer example a little bit later on and also some other examples, but that is what we typically see on a more operational level. We also believe that the operational level is not enough. This is not where it should start. It should start on a more strategic, more on a planning level, um, where we first are typically analyzing the pattern. You see the periodic cycles on the right-hand side of the slide. That is a, a cycle that is typically very much known. The important step is then to draw the right conclusions for the configuration of the network, and that means identify the critical lanes, identify those lanes where you are likely to, to encounter congestions, um, build up redundancies, build up bypasses in your network um, that can be activated then uh, once you move from a more uh, planning, more strategic point of view to the operational day-to-day -day business. And the last part here is to establish the IT capabilities, which allow you then to react dynamically based on the input that you've received in the day-to-day -day operations. In our, on a midterm basis, um, there's a lot related to communication and the alignment of priorities. The patterns, they are known, right? You know what you can expect. You have the forecasts of your, of your customers. You have maybe historic information from the past. So it is 
pretty much known what's going to happen. What is important is to get all the involved stakeholders in the supply chain on the same page. So that can be the the, the 3PL that is that is running the warehouse. It can be the carrier. And of course, it can be your customer. Share the information that you have in order to allow other parties to prepare for the volatility and for the potential capacity constraints that are happening. Also looking at an integrated planning approach. So really do avoid the silo planning. Instead, what we are recommending is a, a concurrent planning approach where um, the constraints and the degrees of freedom are, are considered by all the, 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 the players in the chain. That is heavily supported by, by software products, um, uh, but it also requires communication between the parties. Advanced forecasting techniques. Um, we all we all sit on, on huge amounts of data, um, but to which extent are we really using them today? What we do is to build artificial intelligence-based data models that help to better predict, predict the future, that better help to predict the future demands and to sense demand developments. Using the external information and also internal information uh, to, to better anticipate the future to be able to prepare for the peaks before they materialize. That is happening on a midterm basis. Um, with, yeah. what, we, what we've brought to you is, um, we, we've now had a lot of theory, um, and would then now move to some more practical examples. So this is a typical uh, FMC to supply chain. You do have uh, your raw packaging material suppliers on the left-hand side, then you have your manufacturing side. So those can be internal or external manufacturers. Uh, you have the market disease to the right-hand side, and then you have the customer disease um, at the very right of the slide. It also shows a very typical state of such a supply chain. There might be critical flows, uh, critical inbound flows uh, that are threatening the production schedule. Maybe you have a truck that has just left a production site, is on the way to the market DC, a truck full of valuable goods, and it's currently unclear where the truck is and when it will arrive. Also, you may have a retailer or a customer that has a promotion or a peak right now and that is pulling huge volumes uh, from your market disease, which are then obviously leading to high tension and constraints and congestions at the market disease. So how do we solve this? Um, in our network design, we implement alternative routings. That is what you see for the inbound part, as an example. Though those alternative routings can be faster, they can be more reliable, more ecological, or they can also be slower if, if, if the current capacity allows that. So that is a you know adding flexibility, adding redundancy to the network to account for cases or situations with high volumes. Also, as part of our control tower setups. We implement track and trace, real-time track and trace solutions like Shipio that really tell us where is the truck right now, what is happening outside in, in the real physical world, um, and that support us in identifying the location, but also the state of the trucks. And what we also do is, um, and that is happening on a static, but also on a dynamic level, we implement direct to customer flows to relieve the market disease from high volumes. I've added um, another example to show you a little bit how that works and also how that is being used in, in seasonal setups to relieve the capacities. So this is a typical example. So we do have um, a, a network um, where we have a couple of, of manufacturing sites that are all delivering to a market DC in the center of Germany in this case. And from this market DC, there is a flow going towards the customer warehouse in the south of Germany. During normal operations, during, during normal volume times, um, those flows from that specific um, factory are routed via the market to see. That is the most cost efficient way in this scenario, as it allows the consolidation with other flows. Um, typical costs are, of course, the, the flows or the transportation costs from the factory or the plant to the warehouse, warehousing and inventory costs, and then the flows or the costs for the flow from the warehouse to the customer. Now, what is happening during peak times? During peak times, carriers are, are charging on costs or additional costs for transports. There's waiting times, higher waiting times, higher waiting costs at the market DC. 
and you might have to pay a premium cost for additional shifts, maybe a third shift or people who work overtime uh, in the warehouse. That is add, adding additional cost during peak season and make it then more cost efficient to have a direct to customer flow uh, in this scenario. Um, so what we do, and we, we, we do this, have this, of course, as a static model with our customers, um, where it's used maybe for several months, and then during uh, low volume times, it is deactivated, but it can also be chosen and activated on a day-to-day -day level uh, to, de to, to relieve the market disease from the additional volume. Yeah, Felix, uh, thank you. Uh, let me let me quickly jump on this one. I think you mentioned two uh, key words here. The first one was uh, a, a dynamic planning and an operational view on things, making sure that if there is any uh, uh, operation changes to be done, this needs to be done quickly. That was uh, the first one. The second one was also we need to have, as we mentioned earlier, a, a good and solid foundation of data to base our decisions on. So how does how does Shipio actually support and help in, in this process? What we have been doing over the last couple of years is we have built a network uh, where we do integrate in a very standard way into all different kind of softwares and vendors which are out there on the market. So as you can see, there is an inner circle where we do integrate into different networks where we can retrieve data. We do integrate into a lot of ERP, TMS, uh, carrier TMS are different uh, tools where we see that there's a lot of data richness, uh, especially around transactional data and real-time data. And then, of course, anything that is out there, which is uh, somewhere linked around IoT, which is probably linked uh, to telematics, which is linked to any other data that is out there uh, on the road, as we are talking about road transportation right now. Um, we, we do build these very deep integrations to be able to support the Forflow colleagues and the customer with this kind of data to make sure that they take the right decision. And of course, as you can see, this is a bit like a journey. It's going uh, much further right now. Let's take an example of trailers. Uh, very traditionally, uh, a lot of carriers were using um, telematics in, in, the, in the pulling tractors. But today, if you take the example of Krona, their trailers are equipped when they come out of the production site with an ETA from Shapiro, knowing that any uh, future customer or user of this trailer will have the ability to send the data, uh, including uh, live data and, um, and uh, ETA data, to any kind of customer, to any kind of supplier, to make sure that everything that we described is actually working and that it doesn't take a lead time of 10, 15, 20 days, but it can be really activated on, on the spot. So that's um, just a, a way of looking at data and looking at a network, um, how, we, um, how we support this kind of decision. And I think, uh, Felix, you also have a, a very practical example uh, where we put this into life, right? Yes, we do. So um, as Thomas mentioned, the, having the connection with, with many players in the transportation market really enables us um, to be close to the physical operations, to really have a, a good transparency on what is going on outside and to manage the transportation of our customers in a very, very stable way. Um, when we're looking at the operational level, that is again a typical picture of, of how that looks. and if, uh, more. Most likely, many of you recall the situation around Christmas, around Brexit, um, where we saw that there were really a lot of load restrictions that were taking place. At the same time, uh, carriers were not able to, to find equipment, to find drivers. Um, there were delays that are happening on it, uh, really on a regular basis. And, uh, and that was, of course, creating a lot of tension and a lot of, a lot of stress for many supply chains. How, how do we typically solve that? So as part of the network design phase, um, we identify critical lanes. So we identify lanes where it is of benefit to maybe onboard a second carrier to contract a second or a third carrier because the volume uh, is so high in peak times or it's such a critical lane. Um, in such a scenario, uh, we apply a, a technique called sequential tendering. So in a scenario where a carrier is rejecting a load or is not able to perform a load, it is autom automatically awarded to the second carrier or the third carrier that is uh, contracted for that. And so that avoids that there's any, any loss of time um, and the transportation does play, take place. If that is not possible for whatever reason, we're moving to a, a um, pool of pre-approved carriers uh, that are then uh, able to bid on the spot market for that uh, transport for that transportation. How do we deal uh, with delayed trucks? And it doesn't have necessarily have to be delayed trucks. It can also be trucks that are maybe too early. 
for whatever reason. Um, what happens is um, the the carrier typically books a window, a time window at the unloading place one or two or maybe th even three days in advance. Then there's all the operational delays that are happening um, that result in a deviation between the book time window and the, the actual uh, arrival time of the, of the truck. So there are trucks that are missing their time windows, other trucks are maybe there too early. And what we're then doing is to dynamically reschedule or reallocate, uh, rebook um, the, the, the truck to a new time window. How this technically works and how this is really done, Thomas will explain now in a, on a few slides. Yeah, thanks, Felix. A very interesting question because uh, I think you again mentioned a couple of keywords that we want to have a look at. Um, um, of course, when something is happening, it's going to impact directly the planning of the day. Let's take it a warehouse with a different uh, docks. Uh, typically at a retailer site, all these slots are booked a day or two days in advance. Um, so we need to be very precise and we need to send this information. Is this truck going to be early or is this truck going to be late? into these uh, systems and we need to make sure that we can then handle um, if there's any deviation from the plan. So let's have a first look on how do we create this prediction? So how do we look in the future? Because typically what happens, uh, if we go back to the example that Felix uh, showed, there's a truck leaving somewhere north of Germany and he's delivering to the south of Germany. Let's say it's uh, six hours, eight hours, probably 10 hours drive. So we need to know very much in advance what is going to happen in six hours or in eight hours or probably even the, 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 the next day. Um, and a strong impact on this, uh, of course, will have any rules that we have, especially in Europe, let's uh, say in terms of regulations to driving time, resting time, et cetera, et cetera. So this needs to be priced into the, uh, into the ETA, the estimated time of arrival calculation. But we, we do see also a lot of other uh, factors that may influence this ETA that we want to uh, generate and then send to the receiving side. It can be weather, it can be uh, traffic, it can be accidents, it can be any historical data that happened on this road because typically what we can see or what we detect are these patterns where uh, a carrier is probably picking up something on the way and there's an, uh, another one hour or another two hour stop in between there. So the way we are tackling this challenge is that um, the, the old traditional way of saying I'm going from A to B and it's so many kilometers and I need to do a, top, a stop every four hours or whatever, th th that doesn't work anymore. You need to have, uh, and that's how we built our algorithm in the last couple of years, you need to leverage new technology, machine learning technology. And that's where we put uh, uh, more than 200 different parameters, such as driving regulations, such as waiting times, because you also need to pick up uh, ballots or deliveries, you also need to deliver. Uh, but also anything that happens out there, seasonality, especially with Easter and, and Christmas for, for retail to very specific periods. So all this kind of information is something that we gather. And then on top of this information, we add the operation information for a specific transport order, for a specific load. And that's uh, where we then come into the range, what we call the predictive supply chain visibility. So looking in the future, we know what is going to happen in 10 hours, what is going to happen in 12 hours. And therefore we can compute this ETA and make this ETA available to the carrier. Probably he needs to do something on his side make it available to the retailer who's receiving it and he can probably see okay this carrier has booked, booked a slot for 12 but he's never going to arrive at 12 it will be four or five so what gonna do what, what do i want to do with this slot but also to the shipper because he probably wants to proactively alert the customer and tell them hey there's something going wrong on on, on this specific deliverer delivery i want to i want to send this information and share this information uh, with with our customers and if we have a look uh, a bit deeper into the machine for all the the tech friends on this call, I'll do a two minute um, um, zoom on how we actually do this kind of calculation. Imagine you have all different kind of data sources, TMS, WMS, if your ERP systems, you have the telematics, which is basically the information coming out of the truck. You can have mobile apps, you can have all kind of different in information. You combine this, you package this around the transport order. And again, the transport order is not A to B, but A to B can be 500 kilometers and you have a, a first pattern on the first 20 kilometers, a next pattern on the next 30 kilometers, et cetera, et cetera. Combining this and then predicting and saying what is now going to happen, aggregating this data and looking into the future, that's what's happening on our side, what we call the, the ETA calculation. And again, it's a concept of machine learning. So the machine will learn over time and interpret uh, the different uh, data sources that we have and then allocate a certain 
uh, importance to probably during Easter we need to pay more attention to uh, road and, and traffic. Probably uh, around winter time we want to rank, rank higher uh, the weather because there can be storms, there can be snow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's really how the machine then computes and learns and predicts the future of when is the truck actually going to arrive. Now let's imagine we know exactly when this truck is going to arrive. What's happening next? Um, What's happening next is typically, as Felix described, on a retailer side, you have a slot booking system. So let's imagine there's uh, the Shapiro slot booking system, which uh, has been implemented, and then the carrier goes and books uh, a slot in, in, in the system. Now, what we are going to do and, uh, um, is we, we, we make this slot platform available to the retailer. He's going to share it with his uh, shipper. The shipper will uh, share the responsibility with the carrier. The carrier is going to book the slot. Until here, I guess everybody agrees that's a very standard way of doing it. Now, what do we need to improve this model? What do we need to do now when we have uh, what Felix described earlier on this very agile model? We need to make sure that the arrival time of the truck goes into this tool and that in this tool we discuss together between the shipper, the, the retailer and the carrier, what are the rules to actually change my arrival? Because I know that the slot is two, at two, which I booked, it's no, it's no longer valid for me. I'm going to arrive only at four. And that's where, where we believe the power of neutrality, as Felix called it earlier, comes into play. It's... It's about optimizing a network. It's about optimizing a chain. It's not optimizing one or the other. It's by uh, bringing more efficiencies into the network, we will bring down together costs by waiting time, less admin tasks, everything that we've seen in the beginning. And typically, this can only happen if we work uh, together on, on the space. And that's exactly what's going to happen. And now uh, with Felix, we'll, we'll have a look into what are, what are the benefits if this is actually going to take place and how can each stakeholder in this process actually can have his own optimization on this. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. So looking back at, uh, at the circle that we had in, uh, at the beginning of our webinar today, um, of course, there's different benefits for the different stakeholders. Um, if you look at the carriers, for them, there's obviously an opportunity. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, the, an opportunity to win additional business. The additional business comes from the neutrality of the platform because the platform is uh, treating all carriers equally. Um, and based on the best uh, ratio of, of cost and, and service, obviously, um, there is the opportunity to win additional business. Second, um, reduction of waiting time. Waiting time is something that's typically not really incorporated into the operational transportation planning that carriers do. So whenever there is a, an unexpected delay at a warehouse or at a, at a factory or at a retailer, this is causing additional stress and additional effort to replan all the subsequent transports. With the technology um, that Thomas just described, so being able to, to still get a time window, even though you are maybe late or too early, that is uh, that is supporting you um, to, to avoid that that waiting time and then also avoid the replanning that is that is following. Um, and that also then obviously uh, results in a, in a lot better productivity um, of the of the stuff that is being uh, responsible for the for the operational day-to-day -day planning of trucks um, for a carrier. If we look at the um, the, the FMCG manufacturers, um, of course, today they are heavily, typically heavily involved in um, in aligning the um, the capacities of the warehouse with the capacities of the uh, of the factories or the output of the factories, um, and in solving any potential conflicts or any potential delays. So that is uh, something where we also typically see quite a quite a decrease in the working time, and then that also, of course, uh, translates into reduced overhead costs. Also, and that is quite importantly, maybe Thomas, you can elaborate a little bit more on that later. Is the the decrease of the penalties that uh, FMCG manufacturers need to pay towards the retailers? Yeah, it's it's a very good point. And again, uh, going back to this uh, uh, way of looking at things, where we want to make sure that everybody in this network is is having his share of uh, profitability and uh, optimization in there. Um, so so let's have a look at the retailer. Um, um, again, what we have been seeing with our customers in the last couple of years is 
if you can streamline and optimize uh, the arrival of goods at your warehouse, you can also then optimize all the underlying processes which are then coming behind, meaning that uh, when you know when your truck with a fresh produce uh, 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 vegetables is going to arrive, you know exactly how to plan your teams internally, you know where to put your boxes, you know how to then uh, go into your crosstalk and then repack it in order to make sure that you can send it to your stores. So, so the impact is not only on the receiving side of the retail, it's also going uh, right up into the stores. Why into the stores? Because if you can tell your stores that your truck, which was supposed to be there at six in the morning uh, with uh, the, the fruits and, and, and vegetables probably which are in the promotion today, but this you see that the uh, uh, arriving of the truck is, is being delayed by an hour, you can actually tell your stores that this truck, which is supposed to be there at six today, will be there at 6.30 or at seven. And what's going to happen in the stores? In the stores, people will not wait. They will not be standing in front and saying, hey, where's my truck? Or probably call the DC and say, hey, your truck was supposed to be there at 6.30. Where, where is it? We are waiting for our, for our uh, promotion items. No, they will actually uh, have this information way in advance. They will plan their time differently. They will do other things which are needed in the store uh, of a retailer at 6 o'clock in the morning. And therefore, we see it's streamlining the process, uh, which if there is any problem happening in the in the process very early, it will have a deeper impact also on any later stages in the process. And that's really what we want to do here. Uh, and that's typically where we see a lot of value coming out of it. On the other hand, um, let's let's have a zoom on the warehouses in itself. Um, um, let, let's probably move into uh, the e-commerce, the online retail world. If you know today that your product, which is supposed to be in stock, is not in stock, you will typically say on your website, hey, my product is not in stock because you don't know when it's going to arrive. But if we tell you that this product is going to arrive in the next four hours or probably in the next six hours, you might even tell on your website that it's out of stock because you know that you can pick it within the next 10 or 12 hours and therefore you can still ship it in your guaranteed SLAs as you have put them in front of the customer. So, so that's where we believe this very strong connection coming through transportation into the warehouse, going either into the point of sale, which can be a physical point of sale, meaning the store, but also into the online and into the e-commerce world is a really important um, um, topic that we see and a definite uh, cost optimization uh, that we are seeing in this, in this whole uh, process. Um, and probably just to elaborate, uh, we uh, were mentioning um, some customers uh, that, that are already implementing and experience uh, the, the benefits of using such a system. T take a look at Ekis Granini. So everything that we just mentioned in terms of optimizing uh, the outbound transportation towards the retailer is something that they're experiencing. But we are also adding, and I think that's uh, very true in our world today, um, companies want to reduce carbon footprint. They want to be more efficient. They want to make sure that if the, a truck leaves the site, that it's a full truck load and that it's not going half empty um, because um, your, your carbon footprint will go up. And that's typically another angle of looking at transportation, of looking at optimization, which is all ma also making sure through optimization, through more efficiencies in your network, you can also reduce your carbon footprint. You can do something more green. You can probably keep your brand promises that you're putting in front of your consumers. Um, and that's a very a very good example how you can really leverage this data, this approach uh, towards a better way of uh, transportation system. And Felix, uh, probably uh, just a, a last uh, word from you to, to wrap it up in a, in a more general way. Yes, thanks a lot, Thomas. So um, what are the contributions today and what are maybe the things that you should remember for today? So capacity management itself, it starts on a strategic level. It is, if you, if you think of capacity management as a task that you need to do on, only on a day-to-day -day level, then that's not the right way to do it. You really need to consider it a, a strategic core task in your organization and manage it all the way from strategic down to operations. Dynamic capacity management requires really active attention and active input. And that, that active input to drive the right actions, to drive the right decisions, that input is coming from modern technologies such as GPO that really support you in anticipating the changes, the volatility, and then also support you in taking the right decisions on an operational level. Those are the contributions. And um, yeah, we're happy to be here. And also, if there's any questions, please use uh, the chat box or the, the comment box. Uh, first one is, um, in which frequency does GPO calculate ETAs? 
Is it continuously? How accurate is that ETA? Is it hourly, quarterly, hours, minutes? Yeah, let, let me take this question, Bastian. It's a, it's a very good question because uh, uh, it's actually where our, um, everything depends on in, in future or after laying uh, uh, processes. So um, let, let me take the first one, which frequency does Shibio calculate the ETA? The average frequency is every five minutes. We recalculate the ETA. This can change, of course. If we have, especially in intra-logistics, uh, so on the production side, um, if we have any movements over there, we can also down, go down to 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, we will recalculate the ETA. But typically, in average, it's about every five minutes. Um, how, how accurate are we? Um, we are down to the minute. Uh, as you can imagine, probably in retail and FMCG, we still count in hours. But we do also have um, customers uh, who are delivering in the automotive industry just in time, just in sequence. <clears throat> and there you have slots which can go down uh, until 15 minutes. So, so our way of calculating the ETA is really based on minutes. Um, um, and uh, the refresh then starts every, uh, every five minutes. Probably for the one who, who asked the question, just to give you a benchmark, if you take a Shipio ETA today, 12 hours before arrival, we are already 95% exact. Um, so that's a 95% accuracy, 12 hours before arrival for the long legs, of course, uh, where, where, where this happened. So that's probably just a rough idea on how uh, precise today the ETA calculation can be. Perfect. Thanks for taking that, Thomas. Uh, another one that came in um, could be for either Thomas or Felix. To what degree are uh, Forflow and Shipio integrated already? I, I can take this one, and I, Felix uh, will, will mm -hmm. comment on top. Um, so, so what we started with uh, Forflow already and now uh, more than a year ago, nearly two years ago, is is a full integration of Shipio and, and Forflow. So everybody... Uh, or each customer of Forflow that wants to activate uh, real-time visibility, ETA and predictions can have this uh, in, in the Forflow IT world. They don't need to go out of the IT world of Forflow. They can stay in what they're using today. And then, of course, any kind of data modeling, any um, um, ETA calculation that is completely embedded into the analysis of the Forflow colleagues. So in terms of a technical integration, the two systems are, are natively uh, integrated. And I guess, Felix, probably you can add some color around this where, where, where it goes more into the consulting or analysis part. Yeah, thanks. So, so uh, absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> we started with Shapiro quite a while ago, ago already, and um, we've integrated the two systems so that we are on the one side able to do the strategic network design analysis, but also the operational transportation management in our TMS and uh, incorporate the, the visibility that is uh, the ETA information that is provided by Shipio. It is, it is actually also quite an essential part of, of our world. So in, in the typical 4PL setups that people are operating in, um, we are also, of course, responsible for the operation and transportation management, and there the ETA information uh, of, of Shipio is really, really useful. So we use that. Um, for the exception management to proactively identify any potential delays and then already uh, find active uh, proactively solutions that can uh, mitigate impact on, on our customers' supply chains. Okay, perfect. Thomas and Felix, thanks. Um, another question that came in is, uh, what are typical payback periods for an investment in a capacity management program for your customers? So I guess this really um, aims at the question, what's a typical ROI? Yeah, let me let me take uh, probably a first one, which is more based on the technology view, and then again, Felix, you you might want to add up on this. Um, the the benefit of using Shipio uh, as being a very operational support in the uh, in the in the transport operations is that once you start tracking your trucks, and once you have the ETA, and once you know that probably a delivery is going to be late, you'll have the payback the same day. Meaning that um, from day one, where you have the tracking and we have the ETA calculation, you see already the impact on your customer side. So your support agents, they don't need to call the carriers, the subcontractor, the driver, et cetera, to know where they are. They just have it with a glance on the, on the map. So they see immediately what's going on. You can also automatically push this information to your customer, let's imagine to the retailer and tell them, hey, my slot was booked at five, uh, but I'm arriving at seven or uh, whatever it is. So all these kind of features are available right now. And since uh, we are quite uh, well connected in the FMCG and retail space, you can easily activate it. So I would say from a technology point of view, an impact on your business 
it's probably within the first couple of weeks or couple of months that you see, see already improvement. Of course, then rolling it out to the full network and getting the full return on investment might take a, a bit longer, typically somewhere between three to six months. Uh, uh, and then actually making sure that um, the, the data that we generate has this impact, as Felix described, on the strategic planning. That's a bit longer. And probably, Felix, you, you, you might want to comment on this one to, to get a typical ROI on this one. Yeah, thanks. So typical ROIs are, I would say, between nine and 12 months. Um, that is also approximate to the time where you then also see some of the additional benefits materialize. So we do have, uh, of course, we, we are supporting on, on reducing transportation costs, but also uh, providing more stability through the capacity management itself. Um, but also that has an impact on the other parts of, the, of our customers' organization. So there are effects, for example, that uh, less transportation claims due to, to longer waiting times, uh, of course, also do have an impact on the on the finance department or on the claim management department. And that is then usually materializing a little bit later, um, but typically yeah, around, around 12 months is, I think, a fair statement. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that. We have another question. I think that relates to uh, what was mentioned earlier about the around 200 parameters that are involved in calculating the ETA. Uh, the question is, what is the level of detail um, that are you that, that we're taking into consideration for conditions such as traffic jams, uh, roadblocks, road bans, or weather conditions? Yeah, it's a good good question. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer it, and if I'm not answering, I'll ask the uh, attendee to send me an email afterwards. Um, but the, the level of detail. So basically, if you take a road, let's take Hamburg to Munich in Germany, um, this Hamburg to Munich road will cut it down in probably 100 or more different smaller pieces. On each of this uh, piece for, I don't know, 30, 50 kilometers, we'll have a look at 200 parameters, meaning what is the weather condition on this first part of the, of the, of the road? What is the historical data that I have with a similar condition on this specific part of the road? Does this carrier have a certain pattern where he always goes for the gas station on this type of, of uh, part on, on the road to stop and then we need, uh, or need to take another 15 minutes assumption uh, because he's going to fill up the gas. I mean, that's, that's really the, the level of detail that we're doing. Um, if you ask me in terms of traffic jams, of course, we have predictions on how long does it take to cross a three kilometer uh, traffic jam. But we also will take live data coming from other trucks, uh, probably being in the same traffic jam and understanding how much does it take for him to go 500 meter forwards or how much does it take to him to cross the same traffic jam 10 minutes ago? So that's really the level of detail that we have. Again, it's, um, it's, it's always um, a weighing of which parameter is more important. Is it more important in the traffic jam to uh, probably say, uh, let's have a look at the other trucks which are around this traffic jam? Or is it probably more important to have a look at historical data because this traffic jam is there every morning between seven and nine? And I exactly know that in the last 150 days during the year, it was seven minutes to cross this. So that's the kind of calculation that the machine learning process is doing. But it's definitely down onto, onto this very granular level to kind of understand um, um, how much uh, minutes do I need to add or take away from my ETA, depending on this very specific part of the, of the, of the uh, road that I'm, that I'm going to take. Yeah, thanks a lot, Thomas. Um, we have another uh, question. Um, we heard about earlier about the importance of uh, neutrality um, and, and moving away from siloed solutions. Uh, this question is, why is this important? Why is a neutral point of view important to coordinate capacity planning activities? Why is it important? So we believe it is important because there needs to be a party, or we believe that it is useful to have a party that is weighting the interests of the different stakeholders um, and that is able to implement and move forward with technology and also the process that is that is supporting the overall cause. Um, and it is we will also believe that it is difficult for for a non-neutral party or non-neutral technology to, to achieve exactly this. Um, yeah. And that's maybe um, I think Thomas can relate to that, but there's that's also why HTTP is super neutral, right? So there's many, uh, it is open to any any carrier it, uh, and um, there's no constraint. 
Yeah, d- definitely. I think uh, Felix, uh, it's it's super important, and it also go, goes back to probably what I would call a, a European way of data culture. It means that uh, the data belongs to 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 these people who generate the data, and and we need to make sure that if you are working in this network, everybody is going to benefit jointly from them. But it all always needs to uh, to be the one who's generating the data who decides: Do I want to share this data? Do I want to send this data over? And, and uh, again, we can only be the technology platform and then the decision by itself lies always with the stakeholders. Yeah, yeah perfect. Thanks, Thomas and Felix. Um, uh, the next question um, is uh, uh, asking whether there is an absolute minimum of trucks uh, necessary for using Shipeo. It's, it's a good question. So the absolute minimum is one. Uh, 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 if it's coming from a carrier or from a shipper side. So, so we, of course, do a tracking for very expensive goods and and sometimes it it, it can be related to security questions it can be to insurance questions uh, and and that's a one shot and it's only one truck that we are tracking typically of course when we look at our customer uh, base we do see uh, in the fmcg world at least um, um, higher volumes but in terms of technical constraints or commercial constraints there are none so uh, the, the the minimum is one um, uh, it, it always depends, I think, as we discussed earlier on the, on the business case, on the return on investment. But at least from our side, there's no technical constraint that uh, uh, that you need to have uh, hundreds or thousands of trucks. There, there's no constraint from our side. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, there's a question that was specific to, I think, one of the slides that we showed regarding uh, dark visibility. Uh, the question is, you mentioned shortly uh, dark planning. What are the integrations from your solution to uh, ERP and TMS? Um, and uh, if we use dark, dark planning, what would be the next steps um, if we wanted to do that in the next few coming weeks? Yeah, very good question. I, I think uh, the participant might remember the, the, the slide that we showed with uh, a couple of hundred connections that we have already into TMS or ERP world. So a typical integration would be that we get the transport order out of a TMS or an ERP system, that we do the tracking. And then we feed back any alerts or any ETA back into a doc scheduling or into an ERP system. And that's what's happening on our side with our own doc scheduling. We, we, we feed back the ETA into this tool. So to, to allow dynamic replanning of the, of the docs. Um, if there's any tool to be used, we also, of course, feed any other systems, uh, which are not Shapiro systems, but we can send the ETA into any other doc uh, booking uh, or scheduling module. We can send uh, our ETA um, into any other type of ERP or TMS solution. Uh, and probably uh, if um, there is a more technical interest behind this question, I invite uh, the participant to go to connect.shapiro.com, connect.shapiro.com where we also have all the um, uh, features available in terms of integration. Great. Thanks, Thomas. The next one will be, what are some success factors, typical success factors to achieve efficient capacity management? This one might be, I guess, maybe for Felix. One important factor is to, to anticipate the volume changes and to prepare the network and have a structural process in place. Um, I think the, the second success factor would be overcoming the functional silos. And uh, that is, of course, cooperation, but also between the different uh, companies that are, that are part of the supply chain. The, the first step is facilitating, structuring, uh, and, and maybe uh, yeah, allowing the communication within a company that already for some organizations is, it can be a challenge. Uh, but then also be, be transparent and be open towards uh, towards external companies like uh, like the carriers uh, because they are really relying on, on the input that, a, that, the, that the manufacturer may have. Um, a, a realistic and pragmatic approach, I would say, that's not a successful factor. So it's it will be almost impossible to achieve a hundred percent solution. So start with something that is realistic, but really start, and that's the important part. So. Uh, Start with maybe with something small, something that helps you. Uh, maybe some of the ideas that we that we mentioned today in, uh, during the webinar, and, and implement them, or, or reach out to us and, and ask us how to implement them. But really get get started and not wait for the fully blown solution. And then the last, I would say the last successful factor that I would mention is, is actionable solutions. Um, in the end, whatever we have defined on a more strategic or tactical level will have to be implemented or material or realized on an operational level. So that means that we need to be able to translate the actions uh, into into clear rules or into clear 
communication towards the operational uh, level that is working in the warehouses or that is working at a carrier um, to make sure that they're really able to, to, to action um, the recommendations that are then helping to to um, to mitigate any capacity constraints. So, Felix and Thomas, is there anything else uh, you wanted to cover or bring up before we wrap it up for today? No, I've, it's been great being here. Um, I've been, uh, yeah, let's say, a lot of lot stimulated and provoked by some of the questions that uh, that have been asked by by the audience. So that has been. Really nice, and uh, I look forward to meeting you again. Yeah, a big thank you to you, Bastian, for moderating, but also a big thank you to, to the participant who, who asked the questions who were here today with us. Um, I, I think the main message is um, the, the, the FMCG, the retail world, is moving, and it's moving quickly. And I think what we are seeing with our customer projects on the four-floor side, on our side, but also on the combined projects, is really there's a strong need to do something. There was probably a period too long in the last uh, 10 years where, where we all knew and we saw the problems, but we, we didn't really act on it. I think that's probably a key message today. All the players on the market, they are moving, and that's what Felix said. Um, I think we need to do something. We need to tackle these challenges. Uh, hopefully, we could have uh, or we have provided one uh, or some inspiration how we could tackle this together. And as Felix said, uh, uh, any questions which are still out there, we are more than happy to, to answer. You see the email uh, in the slide. Uh, please reach out uh, to us directly. I'm more than happy to to answer if there's any any other questions open.